Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. This is Richard Gearhart. And Elizabeth Gearhart. Welcome to Passage to Profit on WOR 710 AM, the voice of New York. At Passage to Profit, we're all about entrepreneurs and new businesses. And education for entrepreneurs as well. Education takes many forms, including the innovative platform our guest has developed. If you're like me, running a small business or even thinking about it, you want your employees to learn the skills they need as quickly and as effectively as possible. Well, our guest tonight is Sam Cayucci from One Huddle. He's invented an innovative program to teach employees at small businesses the skills they need in an interactive and fun way. After we talk with Sam, we'll hear from our executive spotlight guest, Michelle Joseph, about her program for students called SGAP Leaders and other incredible educational programs. Yes, yeah, so Michelle brought two of her students with her to pitch their companies and what they're doing. So after we have our interviews with Michelle and Sam, we'd like to hear what you listeners think. So listen to the pitches, then go to the Passage to Profit page at Gear Heart Law and vote for your favorite. Also, you can contact us with any thoughts you have using the form at the bottom of the page. We'd love to hear from you. Now let's get this party started. Well, welcome, Sam. We're eager to hear about your program. So tell us a little bit about what your company does. Thanks for having me. So One Huddle, we are a game platform for employee training. So the concept really came out of the idea that uh, we know that our workforce today is changing pretty dramatically. We know that the jobs that people are performing are going to be changing and impacted more than ever by things like robots and automation. And I think that with that in mind, the ways that companies are training and developing their people have largely stayed the same. And we think that at a time when we have five different generations of work at the same time for the first time ever, at a time when employees are on the go, how do we make training something that employees want to do instead of just have to? We do that with our game platform. That's wonderful. I remember when I started my first job in the chemical industry, I thought I knew everything and <laughs> quickly learned I knew nothing. <laughs> so. Or they give you these big manuals. I started in the chemical industry, too. They give you these big, thick books that you were supposed to read, and then you're, half the time what there was in the books didn't even match up with the job, right? So it's a tough way to be trained. And I think for us today, you know, the jobs, depending on what side of the aisle you're on, some people think that robots are not going to take anybody's jobs. Some think they're going to take everybody's jobs. And I think, the, you know, for us, we know that no matter what, jobs are going to change. The things you do at work are going to shift, which means we need to use technology and software to sit at that intersection to be able to react as fast as possible to the way that tasks are changing and jobs are changing. Building manuals, building PowerPoints, building videos, it's archaic. So, so many companies still stuck in the Stone Age, we're trying to address that problem. So how does your software actually work? What does it do? With One Huddle, companies can download, we're iPhone and Android native, so employees can download an app, log in using their corporate email address, and uh, instead of a module or chapter in a book, they play a game. So two to three minute quick burst games. As you play, uh, you move up leaderboards against your coworkers. As you play, uh, the proof that we found is you learn faster through struggle that's introduced through a game. So you're playing quick burst trivia. If you're a restaurant and you're an employee, you're playing games on uh, front of house st stuff. You're playing games on the menu. You're playing games on mission, vision, core values. So as a employee, you learn quicker by first this stuff being at your fingertips and not just something you can only use when you're on the job. And you also uh, learn better because of the fact that you are competing constantly against your coworkers, which drives up participation to rates that no other learning platform has ever seen before. Is this multiple choice then? Is it a series of multiple choice questions that you have to answer quickly? Yeah, so we have a ton of different formats, but think like quick trivia. So multiple choice, true, false, identify the image. Uh, so there's a few different formats of questions. The reason we did that is uh, we still have five different generations at work. So it's not just the you know scary M word as millennial goes. Uh, <laughs> well, that so, is scary. <laughs> so we have you know we found that trivia games consistently rank at the highest levels of, of the app store. People understand them. They understand the mechanics behind them. So we found that trivia is the fastest way to gain adoption and engagement from all workers in the workforce. Uh, the other cool part of the platform is that employees can build the content. So as work changes, the HR person sitting in the corner office literally and geographically, the farthest away from the employee-customer interaction, they're not able to react quick enough to the way work is changing. Uh, if you're a company with a 1,000 employees, you actually have a 1,000 learning and development people, and we're putting them to work uh, to suggest new content as work changes. 
So that was something I was going to ask you is who writes the content. So we have a yearly or bi-yearly meeting of the law firm. And one of our attorneys, James Klobuchar, always puts together patent jeopardy. <laughs> he finds... really does kind of liven up the meeting, <laughs> yeah, let me tell you. A whole day on intellectual property is a lot for even us. Yeah, so it can get very technical very quickly. As you probably know, the intellectual property stuff goes deep pretty fast. So how do the employees go about crafting the games for that or giving you the content? So the real intellectual property that we have isn't just the game the players play, but it's the authoring tool that creates the games. To build an e-learning course today, if you're whether you're in academia or you're in a corporate environment, it takes 107 hours to build a well-developed and designed course. It takes less than 10 minutes to build a game on OneHuddle. So a manager, a middle manager, or a frontline worker can log on to OneHuddle, click build a game. So back to that restaurant example, it's you know two o'clock and we have a five o'clock service. A manager at the, at the restaurant can log on to OneHuddle, click build a game, build a game out of the menu and special items for this evening and get it up and out into their workforce in literally minutes. So the speed at which you can get content up and out is something that, you know, because it's so time consuming on any other platform, companies just throw their hands up and don't develop training that they could. So how do we know that the employees are actually learning something using this method? One of the missing ingredients today in learning and development is struggle. When we did all of our research on the way the brain learns, we constantly came back to this element of struggle where you learn more through a test than you do by reading or watching. I just saw a Microsoft study the other day that came out said that the average attention span of a millennial is nine seconds. A goldfish is 11. <laughs> <laughs> What's a baby boomer? <laughs> I'm <afraid to> ask. <laughs> what? what do you say again? <laughs> so, you know, I think that for us, it's if we keep building videos, manuals, and we don't make it accessible, the reality is if you can't remember what you learned, you didn't learn it. 87% of what you learn in a live training you forget within 30 days. Our platform is constantly measuring where you're struggling and then spinning up. We have an algorithm in our platform that's spinning up questions user by user based off what they are individually struggling with, something you can never do with a traditional e-learning course. Wow, that's brilliant. You know, when I had to study for the patent bar, everybody told me just take the old exams online and that's basically what I did, and that's what got me through it. Just like immersion, when you learn a new language, what do we always tell people? You know, if you want to learn Spanish, move to Spain. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, so, you know, it's the same thing. I think that if we just think that uh, training is an event and you check a box, uh, we're putting our employees in a position where there's no way they're going to be able to react to the way work is changing. Uh, we need tools that react faster. Can you give us an example of a question that might appear in one of the training tests. Sticking with our restaurant example, we have a dozen games for bartenders at restaurants. So we have games on different spirits. We have games on, we have a sommelier game. Uh, so it might be a situation where question spins up and it says a guest asks, what is in the XYZ old fashioned? The user who's going through that training will have to identify the specific spirit out of a three, four, eight, ten question or answer set and select the correct answer. If they get it wrong, They'll be prompted with the correct answer, and they'll be forced to quickly move on to the next question. It also might only be a game they can only play once a day. So I'm sure nobody on the air has ever crammed for a test before. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do all-nighters anymore. <laughs> so, you know, what we learned is that people cram for certain trainings, or they, they test out well because it's short-term memory, not actually something that's sticking. You know, so our platform constantly randomizes and spaces content out over time to predict when employees are starting to forget things and alerting them about a new game to play at the exact moment we think they're going to be starting to forget it. So do you have any data from any, let's say you have done it with a restaurant, do you have data from them saying how this has improved their employee performance? We look at three things that we can measure that we constantly have to share with C-level executives. The first and the easiest one is knowledge retention. We can show time and time again with uh, several studies that if you learn through a game, it has a direct impact on how long you know something. So uh, long-term knowledge retention is, is number one. The second is speed of onboarding. So if I get hired at that restaurant, how long does it take for me to get from zero to 60? Let's say it's two months. Uh, we have scenarios across the globe where we've cut onboarding time in as much as half because of the way you learn through a game leading up to day one and then in your first few weeks of the job. So cutting speed of onboarding. The third is the most important to C-level executives, which is uh, driving sales performance. And if we're in a customer-facing role, we're talking about higher closing averages. If we're in a service role, we're talking about more five-star reviews on Yelp. That's great. So 
if this is a training exercise, it seems like it's a combination of training as well as testing, but where do they get the background information initially to answer the questions correctly? So you might be able to assume that somebody has been a bartender before, they know how to make a martini, right? But what if you're training somebody to be a bartender and they don't know how to make a martini? So how does your test work with that level of knowledge? One of the things we found is that learning happens in stages. And when you learn any new skill for the first time, there's a first stage of where you have to understand the knowledge behind how you do something. Continues to come back that testing people on information before they have ever seen it, the struggle that's introduced because of that, which seems counter to the way all of us go through our learning experience from kindergarten through college, testing people on information before you've ever seen it leads to longer lasting retention of information. It triggers uh, a mechanism in our brain where we're searching for the answer And because of that struggle, it's better retained. You're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Our guest tonight is Sam Cayucci from One Huddle. We'll be right back after this message. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearhart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearhart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed, and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit Gear GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And our special guest tonight, Sam Cayucci from One Huddle. So, Sam, tell us about how you got into the whole testing thing. I started my whole career uh, was in the sales space. So I managed sales teams for a few different companies, startups, a a large franchise company I worked with, and I also worked with a big publicly held company. And at every stop, I sort of saw it getting harder and harder to take a new hire right out of college and put them into a sales or revenue generating role. And all the companies I worked for, I was managing sales and running sales. So uh, it really started to pique my interest into two things. One, uh, how do we get employees skilled up as fast as possible coming out of a university experience that maybe isn't giving them all the tools they need? I learned things like only 1% of U.S. universities even offer a single course in professional selling uh, at a time when sales jobs were, you know, uh, all over the place. So that was one reality. The second was, uh, how do we skill people up for social communication scenarios or uh, handling objections or being face-to-face with a customer? Uh, That led me down a path to think about, one, how do we make it uh, something that everybody can access, not just something you're doing at your desk, uh, and also something that as you interact with it, improvement actually happens. And I just didn't see that currently with a lot of the software in the space. Does this go across all industries? Does it work better with some? Like, Would it work with a law firm? So we're in about a dozen different verticals today. It's probably as a tech startup, it's one of our biggest strengths and our biggest challenges as you start to cross over into different verticals. We start in the sports space. So we have about 25 sports brands from Madison Square Garden to the Golden State Warriors to if you're a soccer fan, UEFA internationally. So what kind of training programs would you have for them? For their sales force, how do we get salespeople skilled up to understand product knowledge as fast as possible as information changes rapidly? Uh, Also, guest service staff. So everybody at a sports venue like Madison Square Garden is customer facing. How do we make sure that every experience that a service team member has, whether they're a bartender or security guard or a parking attendant, is one that is of the quality that MSG would expect out of all their full-time team members. So start in sports. That sort of opened us up to a whole world of uh, hospitality examples and restaurants. So today, from sports to restaurants to hotels, uh, most recently, uh, we're working with the city of Newark, a totally uh, new area for us where frontline workers inside of cities who traditionally don't get access to anywhere near the level of skill development they deserve is something that our game is bringing access to in major U.S. cities. So 
you know, this has grown from something that was only for salespeople to now something that we're impacting people at all corners of the workforce. Tell us a little bit about the intellectual property you have around your business. Every step of the way, whether it's a tagline or it's our logo or our marks, we've I've been pretty on top of making sure that all of that stuff and all those boxes are checked. So we have trademarks for our logo and our brand. So how did you come up with the name One Huddle, for example? The company was originally named Sales Huddle. And as we got the product out and we started to grow, we started to realize that this thing has an impact far beyond just sales reps. And the story that sort of emerged in the way I say it is we have one global workforce that is constantly trying to get upskilled. And we have the one platform to get people skilled up. We really do believe in a world where If a company invests the same amount of time, energy, and effort in a frontline worker, uh, that frontline worker could someday be a manager, could be a director, could be a C-level executive if we invested the right amount of time and energy and resources into them. So we take employees all the way through the workforce uh, using one huddle. And so you also mentioned during the break that you have patents covering your technology too. All of our patents revolve around our game build tool. So while the game itself is usually what everybody loves to talk about, the reality of the challenge in the workforce is middle managers and frontline managers that can't quickly develop content. So uh, we're patent pending on uh, a few patents around our content management system and authoring tool where, like I mentioned earlier, you can literally build a game in minutes on our platform. It's something that uh, no other authoring tool can currently do. I don't think this would ever happen, but let's say McDonald's like totally flushed this whole thing out and wanted to sell it to Wendy's which will never happen because it's such a competitive advantage, right? But who would own that? So there'd be the content, there'd be the platform, would just split the intellectual property? Like who would get the revenue from that? So when we build a platform for a client, uh, the content that's authored on the platform by the client is owned by the company. If you are a large hotel brand and you are building 30, 40, 50 games a year on different training or communication topics, when you build a question on our platform, you retain ownership of that IP. At the same time, One Huddle has built over 500 games in our library. We have over 6 million game questions we've designed on topics ranging from brand training to soft skill training to diversity and inclusion training to harassment training to we even have airports using us for active shooter training in our serious game category. So we retain ownership of a tremendous amount of our content that we use as, call it the framework for companies to build off of depending on the industry. And how do you monetize the business model for this then? So we're a SaaS platform. Companies pay a small integration fee at start. We can have a company spun up and live in less than 30 days. If you were, as a brand out there, was going to invest in a learning management platform, you should expect nine months to 15 months to be live. The fact that we can take an emerging brand, take their content, Our game design team, based right here in the Northeast, can take your material, convert it into games, brand the platform, and get you spun up and live and launched in less than 30 days. So we charge an upfront fee to do that, then an ongoing fee depending on users. Is it required that the company already have written training materials in order to build the games? It's not required, but the way we currently sell, we prefer to work with brands who have their stuff together because at the same time, we, we are not consultants and we want to make sure we work with brands that are best in class and they know their stuff. So how many companies do you have right now? So we have about 80 logos currently on our platform uh, and it's across about a dozen verticals. Would you ever do it for a law firm? <laughs> I'm just thinking. <laughs> so we have... How to sue somebody. <laughs> yeah, Three no. easy questions. <laughs> Some of our stuff with dates and deadlines gets really serious and complicated really fast. And it would be nice for the whole team to be able to figure all that out together. I mean, we do know it, but everybody on the same page. Do you ever foresee that? So current companies we work with today, in-house counsel, will at some point put their hands on the product and use it as a way to deploy serious trainings or compliance training or risk any type of risk management content. I remember when we were building, when we were creating the concept for the platform, I remember sitting in my living room watching my wife study for the LSAT. And watching her flip quiz cards and go through the Kaplan stuff. And, you know, a lot of that influenced the way that we started to research and think about how do we make this whole process faster. So any intros are are welcome. So did she pass the bar? She did. (laughs) All right. (laughs) That's why I'm able to be a startup founder. (laughs) She's the boss. Our guest tonight is Sam Cayucci from One Huddle. You are listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710. Do not go away because we have an incredible executive here to talk about her company and two of her students who are doing 
fascinating things in the world. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Now we're very pleased to have Michelle Joseph with us for our executive spotlight. Michelle runs SGAP Leaders. So Michelle, please tell us all about it. SGAP Leaders works with 7th to 12th graders and those who are ambitious as well as those who are curious and we expose them to STEM, sustainability, and social justice issues. Our goal, simply, is to grow the next generation of global leaders. So tell us about some of the programs. Absolutely. The first program that is one of our signature programs, quite frankly, is called our Sustainability Challenge. We get about 120 students from five different schools and school districts together, and they wrap their arms around a real-world case study. For instance... Um, Some of our students at the sustainability challenge that was held in Washington, D.C., they had to work with the Audi Field Stadium. Uh, They walked through the stadium. This is a soccer stadium. And they also got to see how things were built. Uh, So it was more tactical education, more uh, environmental awareness. And then they had to come back and work in school groups and come up with what is the best way to put together a solar array at that stadium. So it's been very successful and uh, we're excited about being here and sharing it uh, with our other programs in addition to the sustainability study. Are you saying that people coming through uh, that are in that 7th to 12th, that Generation Z group, what are you saying that's different about that generation than previous generations when it comes to social justice issues? Excellent question. Um, One of the reasons that I'm really excited about what we're doing with SGAP leaders is I see this generation uh, the Z generations, they're, they're the ones that are really focused on making a difference in the world. And with that being said, um, the social justice becomes the momentum in which they go after it. And STEM and sustainability happen to be the vehicle that they solve uh, their problems. I'll give you an example. Um, ben Matthew is one of our students. Um, ben is now, I believe, a junior in high school. And what I like about Ben is he came up with his own app that is going to solve a problem with um, homeless organizations. So this app will allow folks who are at homeless institutions, instead of just getting cash, these are homeless shelters primarily, they will actually be able to go on the app and select exactly what they need. Uh, And it comes directly to them instead of the cash. So here it is, a student coming up with a solution to a problem using his own intelligence and creativity. It's amazing. I love this generation. So, Michelle, how does this integrate with the school programs? What we try to do is work in concert with three programs primarily. We have our Think Design for Social Entrepreneurship. This is one that Ben has presented to, and also one of our students here that is going to be talking a little bit more about is Brandon Persaud. He's speaking to our Think Design for Social Entrepreneurship. It uses design thinking as a vehicle for a five-hour workshop to engage the students, and then we encourage them to continue with their projects either in the school or connect them with other opportunities and organizations. The third program that we work with is really tied to our relationships with Covanta Energy and other companies. Uh, What's nice about that is they get to tour different facilities, learn about environmental engineering, ask questions, get involved with uh, internships. So it's an exposure. So again, it's inspiring our students, encouraging them, and ultimately empowering them. I would imagine that 
the source for a lot of these projects is the students themselves, right? Um, do they ever get uh, suggestions for projects from outside sources? I think that um, some of the students come with their own ideas. For instance, I mentioned Brandon, who we have a, a chance to talk with later. He and his brother started the KB Operation Hope. Uh, they started it, I believe, at the grand old age of 9 and 11. He'll correct <laughs> wow. me if I'm wrong. Uh, but it's a wonderful organization, and they were looking for ways in which they could get their voices out and, and to share it. And it's a great opportunity for, to inspire students. So I'm excited about sharing what they've done, and I let him kind of tell his story rather than me tell it. But I, I definitely wanted to let you know that they do get their own inspiration outside of SCAP. How about the fundraising process? If I had a great idea and I come out of uh, and I get it out of the gate, or what does that look like for some of the people coming through your program? There are a couple programs and partnerships that we have with corporations and individual benefactors. We like the students to pitch their ideas uh, either at one of our programs like the Think Design Workshop. We capture it uh, via video and we share it with our benefactors one of whom actually has helped one student to move forward. Um, I'll give you an example for another program that we work with uh, with one of our partners. It's called our Global Experience and UN Tour. Um, specifically, there's a student leadership conference that's held at the United Nations, and um, one of our students here, uh, Zula, is going to be working with them. Zula actually uh, was one of the chairpersons at the conference. You'll hear more about her story. But we thought it would be a value for her and her interest. So one of our benefactors actually sponsored her so that she could participate in the conference. Uh, so that's an opportunity, again, where we see students are interested and we want to support their interest. Wow, benefactors. That makes me think of like the real olden days when an artist would have somebody <laughs> who would <laughs> like support their art career. So that's right. That's really awesome. So these are individuals that have the money and the time that really want to help these students become leaders. Correct. So how do you find benefactors? Is that a secret? <laughs> Probably shouldn't say. <laughs> no, no secret, no secret. I think it's just making sure that you're telling your story correctly to an audience that really sees that we need to plant the seeds right now for the future and working in concert with our students and seeing their value as we plant the seeds. I mean, we've been doing this as SCAP leaders, uh, the concept since 2010. Uh, we became a 501c3 in 2016. And during that process, I've seen students who were in middle school who are now graduated, going to Ivy League schools, who've come back and spoken to other students. So planting those seeds are critical. And the sooner we do it, uh, the better. How many schools are you currently in? Very good question. We have 72 different schools and school districts that we've uh, worked with uh, over the years in New York, New Jersey, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. And we've impacted 2,544 students over the years. Wow. And what about uh, at the college level? Have you ever thought of bringing it up past 12th grade or what would be the reason not to? I actually think that um, the college level, they've already kind of set the stage of what they're doing. So I find it better to plant the seeds with the 7th, 8th, and ninth graders. That tends to be our sweet spot. Oftentimes, by the time we're in 11th and 12th grade, you're inundated with you know, PSAT, SAT, all these tests, you name it, A to Z. So having an opportunity to do it early is where we feel we can benefit the most for our students. What is your best success story so far? I will highlight one student. Her name is Ifoma Whitethorpe. And Ifoma started with us in 10th grade. I remember her rolling her eyes and saying, we got to do this again. What What is the importance of doing this? Until she finished our leadership series. Uh, involuntarily, she grabbed me and hugged me and said, now I get it, Miss Michelle. This is exactly what you wanted me to do. And now she's a uh, second year, rising third year at Harvard University. And one of the things she said that helped her was her experience with SCAP. It really influenced her even to the point of her choosing her major, which is chemistry, with the international flavor. So we love those wonderful stories, and she comes back to speak to her students often. And we'll be right back. You're listening to Passage to Profit. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley, the inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years, hundreds of products later, and dozens of patents. 
I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world, QVC, HSN, Evine Live, and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me, Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventingatoz.com, inventingatoz.com. Email me, lisa at inventingatoz.com. Treat yourself to a day chock full of networking, education, music, shopping, and fun. Go to my website, inventingatoz.com. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Our guests, Sam Kayochi from One Huddle and Michelle Joseph. Before we jump right into the pitches, we have some vital info. If you've heard us before, you know what we're going to say. <laughs> when you're listening to the pitches, please think about which one you like best and go to the Passage to Profit page on the Gearhart Law website. You need to scroll down and you can find the poll to vote. That's Gearhart Law, spelled G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. Everyone gets one vote, and the voting is open for one week from now. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And the podcast of this show is available the Monday after the show airs. So if somebody missed it, they can listen to that, and you can get your friends to vote. And just remember the name of the show by imagining you're walking down a passage with a huge pot of gold at the end. Passage to profit. And may your passage be short and your profit be huge. I hope so. (laughs) I'm still waiting for that day. (laughs) So getting back to the pitches now, we have Brandon Persaud, who's the co-founder of KB Operation Hope. Brandon, you have two minutes. Go. Hi, thank you for having me on the show. KB Operation Hope is a non-for-profit charitable organization that focuses on providing educational and medical necessities to children in impoverished countries. So far, we have helped children in countries in South America, India, and some areas in Jamaica. Basically, we do a lot of fundraising to provide all these necessities to children in orphanages, special needs schools, homes, and public high schools, and anybody who really needs it. We believe that the next generation is the future, so we need to put all of our effort into making sure they have everything they need to prosper. That's my boy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's beautiful. And who are some of your best sponsors for this? A lot of the fundraising we've done is basically, it's all started in our high school from bake sales where we raised around $3,000 just on small goods. And we've also received donations from stores like Louis Vuitton, uh, located in Manhasset, Long Island. They've been a big help donating diapers, uh, over-the-counter medicines, and small organizations like Amtrust um, and other title insurance companies that are uh, related to them. That's fantastic. So tell us more about the types of supplies that you're able to provide. We provide um, a large range of supplies from backpacks, writing utensils, textbooks, to over-the-counter medicines, band-aids, hand sanitizers, basically anything, common daily necessities that they're in lack of. And how do you decide how to distribute these products? We meet with government officials who tell us basically where there's a need for these materials and where there's a lack of materials. So we reach out to those areas, contact them, and see if we could come down ourselves, distribute all the goods. And if we cannot, we have a contact down there who is able to retrieve anything we send down and distribute them themselves. Why this cause? Our parents are immigrants from third world countries, and we traveled back there since we were young. When we first went back to that country, we realized how lucky we are to live the life we do. We're lucky that we could get on a bus and go to school, that we could open our backpacks and have a pencil just to take notes. Once going back to these countries and realizing that these kids do not have that opportunity, we wanted to give something back to them because we know that we're lucky enough to do this. That's great. So how many kids are you helping right now? Do you know? In terms of amount of kids, no, but we have helped over five orphanages, ranging from 100 kids per orphanage and two special needs schools in Guyana, South America, and also a small orphanage in India. And we are currently working on donating educational supplies as well as two basketball hoops to a small school in Jamaica. Are you trying to make me cry? (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. Thank you. That's beautiful. I have a quick question for you, Brandon. How do you engage your fellow high schoolers to get involved with Operation Hope? 
we reach out to these other high schoolers and basically try to explain our message to them. It all started in our high school, the Knox School, located in Long Island, New York. We brought down four ambassadors with us from that school to Guyana, South America, which basically helped us distribute all the goods. After doing that, we sort of blew up on social media from the orphanages posting us on their social media, government officials. We were interviewed by their newscast team. And after some people seeing that, we started getting contacted from other schools. We have an ambassador at American University who started a drive at her school to basically collect clothes and educational necessities. And when kids hear the message of what we're trying to do, that we're trying to improve the lives of the next generation, they can relate to understand that the next generation is more important than what we are contributing. What's been your biggest challenge? Our biggest challenge would have to be reaching out to other areas and other countries. Since I'm still in high school and my brother is now a first year college student, it's hard for us to go down to these countries and donate these gifts ourselves. So we're trying to connect to other people who are able to have connections down in their countries to distribute the goods themselves. I'll do Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> Darn, I wanted that one. <laughs> How do you find the places to donate? How do you find like the orphanages or the, the children or the schools that you're donating to? Over the course of the years, my parents have developed a large network and have had so many great contacts and friends. We believe that not everything has to be about business. When you're able to form a relationship with somebody, that relationship can take you to as many places that you would need. So by basically forming these relationships, it opened up a world to different countries and we started meeting more and more people. Through Miss Michelle's program, um, student Global Ambassadors, we were able to meet our contact in India who was able to receive the gifts that we donated to the children's in the orphanage. So do you get a chance to go and meet the students that you're helping? So far, we took a trip down to Guyana in 2017 with four ambassadors. We took two weeks off from school and we were able to go in ourselves and distribute the goods to three orphanages, a special needs school and um, one special home. So if somebody wanted to sponsor you, how would they go about doing that? Basically, they can come into contact with either me or my brother. And from there, we will work on sending like banners and everything that they would need to promote our company and themselves at their location. What's your website? Our website is www.kboperationhope.org. Do you actually take the goods down there yourself then? Most countries we do. And then Amazon is not delivering to some of these places yet. <laughs> no, not as of yet. We've had several contacts that were able to receive the gifts down there in the countries that we're not able to go down ourselves. Shipping costs usually range from $300 because we ship gigantic barrels filled with all of the supplies that are about probably around six feet tall. So these barrels contain a lot of goods and roughly around $300 for them to receive it. What would you say a perfect world looks like? I always get asked by investors with my business five years from now, 10 years from now, and it's hard to always answer that question. But for you, what five years from now, what, what does this look like? In five years from now, we hope to reach to a lot of more areas that are in need and to help pretty much anybody that we can. No matter what, this world will always have problems. But as long as there's people who are out there willing to solve those problems, we could always make a life for the better. So do you see yourself doing this for a long, long time? I do. My brother and I started KB Operation Hope as a project basically to help those in need in my parents' home country. But as we grew older, we realized the harsh reality of the world we live in. Yes, it's a reality, but that does not mean we have to accept it. After that, we realized that we can make a difference if we just put our mind to it. So while also trying to keep up our high GPAs in high school, we also managed to take this company and push it forward. And no matter where our future leads, we are going to always have this dream of making this company something very large and helping those in need. I just wanted to check in with you. You mentioned your brother. Tell me how you started this concept. I know um, initially I had an opportunity to meet Kyle and he introduced me to you, but I, I wanted to find out a little bit about the story between the two of you. How did you start to work on developing Operation Hope next stage? So as I said previously, our parents from a third world country, they would take us back on trips to orphanages and special needs schools to donate. My mom was adopted, so we would always go back to her orphanage to help out and to donate anything that we can. And one day we encountered a, a young little boy at the name of Jason. He asked us for a piece of chocolate that we were eating. And as little kids, we were selfish and we didn't really know that they were in more need of it than we were. So my mom came up to us and she said, give him a piece of chocolate. So we did. And then we started having a conversation and we learned about the life that these kids live. And we learned that they're not able to have the opportunity to go to school. So that really inspired us to take up something and to push forward with it. And then KB Operation Hope was born. 
Yeah, I know. When I was growing up, I was like, what? There's kids that want to go to school? Because <laughs> 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 we're so spoiled here and we don't even know it, right? I totally agree with that. As a high schooler right now, I see kids who always wake up in the morning saying, oh, why do I have to go to school? Why do I have to study for the test? When there are kids in other places in this world who are dying to have an education that we are to make something of their life so they could have a better future, so they could benefit others just like them. Well, Brandon, you're a very wise young man, and we really are grateful that you came to Passage to Profit to share your story with us. How can our readers get in touch with you again? They could go to our website, which is kboperationhope.org, and there's contact information there and a donation link. That's really great. And I think they can also find you through SCAP Leaders. Is that right? Absolutely. SCAPleaders.org. We're right there, too. And you can reach us as well as Brandon and all of our students who are awesome leaders. And you're listening to Passage to Profit on iHeartRadio. WOR, the voice of New York, will be back right after this. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed, and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. We just heard an incredible pitch from an incredible young man who's part of SCAP, and we have another incredible student who belongs to SCAP who's coming up to do her pitch now. Her name is Zula Oliveira, and she was a chairperson for the 2019 Student Leadership Conference on Development at the United Nations. Welcome, Zula. Thank you so much for having me here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? I've been working with ESCAP now. This is my second year. Miss Michelle was first introduced me to this wonderful organization. And I had the opportunity in 2018 to do a group tour and global experience at the United Nations, where myself and other students from the New York and New Jersey area visited the United Nations. And we learned about all the bodies of the United Nations, how they work, their 17 sustainable development goals. And this past February, I returned to the United Nations for the Student Leadership Conference on Development with the GEM Motivators. And basically, it is a conference where young people from around the world, from many different high schools, Mexico, India, Georgia, the country, and we came together and we had different satellites um, on a video call. And we all spoke about how to solve one problem that we can all relate to in this world. So this year, our problem was focusing on the sustainable development goal number six, which is clean water and sanitation. So for two days before the conference, we had prep periods where we would work for several and several hours tirelessly to come up with a document to present to United Nations Youth Envoy about how we think they should solve the clean water and sanitation issue in this world. So what did you come up with? There were three groups. There's three sub-themes, sub-theme A, B, and C. One of them was about water pollution, one is about sanitation, and one was about um, wildlife and recycling. We came up with many solutions that we presented to the board. One of them was making a toilet that can be used in third world countries that has a sink on top so that when you wash your hands, it flushes a toilet. And that idea enforces sanitation, but also it saves and conserves water. What would be a startling fact or something that you've learned along the way that somebody might not be aware of or educated on this topic? What would be something that would be surprising to the average listener? One thing that I learned is that in New York, you can't collect rainwater, which I found crazy um, because all around our country and around the world, there are people who um, live in poverty and they may not have access to clean water. Um, Rainwater is something that you can filter and you can use in your home. You can use it to bathe and to cook, to wash dishes. And there are many places like New York where you cannot collect rainwater. It's against the law. And so we presented to the U.N. uh, suggesting to the U.N. member states maybe allowing all of their countries 
to let their citizens collect rainwater so they can use it for personal use. Obviously, somebody asked the question, why couldn't you collect rainwater? Did you ever get a answer for that? We never got to that answer, but we definitely came up with many other solutions to other problems. One of them, of course, wildlife and recycling. We definitely want to make sure that laws are implemented against you know, leaving litter in the streets, in the water, um, at the beach, so that our wildlife is not affected. Because the wildlife, I believe, is just as important as us. We all live and we all work together on this earth. And so I believe if we help protect them, it will benefit us. I was going to say, what were some of the things that you found just interacting with other kids from different parts of the world? What, what were some of the takeaways? So I found that many of us, even though we're from all over the world, we had very similar experiences. My father is Brazilian, and I had the opportunity to live in Brazil for five years from elementary through middle school. And Brazil being a third world country, even though I had the opportunity to attend private school and I lived a life that isn't the typical Brazilian life, everyone in Brazil has their experience with clean water, sanitation, and um, just issues surrounding water and pollution. And one of my team members, who was the afternoon chairperson in the conference, she was from Bangladesh. And the experiences she had with clean water and sanitation in Bangladesh and the lack of water and pollution were very similar to the ones that I faced in Brazil. And so it was very interesting to see that around the world we have the same problems. And so even though we have different experiences, we came together to solve a common issue. And so what were some of the solutions that you're team found? Well, my team found that as youth, it's important for us to be the spokesperson of these movements. And so we realized that we had to reach out to the other high schools across the globe, other high schools in our area, and really push our fellow students, friends, and peers to want to make a change, to make a difference. Because this is our world and we live in it, and we are the next generation, we are the future. So if we want a clean world, if we want clean water, we have to encourage people like ourselves. So I believe the number one thing that I gained from this experience is sharing my experience with others so that they might be interested and join along. I was extremely impressed by this idea of using the water you use to wash your hands to flush the toilet. Where did that come from? So one of my colleagues from the conference, he's from Tbilisi, Georgia, and he came here with a whole bunch of his friends and they all participated and he actually showed us a slideshow presentation that he made for us the day before the conference. And he really spearheaded this idea that all toilets should have a sink on top, no matter you know where you are. Lots of these third world countries that lack water, you know, if you don't have water, you cannot bathe properly, you cannot wash properly. Along with that comes diseases. So he really wants to enforce you know, living in a clean world and also a safe world where we're not wasting the water that we're given. And that's even better because you might put some soap down the toilet, too. <laughs> Clean it up a little. Yeah, that's true. Well, I understand this is your senior year and you'll be moving on, but we hope that you come back and share your experiences with other student leaders. Um, do we know what's next for you as far as uh, college? We don't. That would be a surprise, but I plan <laughs> to announce it in a very special way. But even though I am graduating from SGAP, I really am excited to come back and to mentor the next SGAP leaders. I have two younger brothers, they're 12 and 10, and they already talk about, oh, Zula, what's this SGAP thing that you do? I want to do it. And so I like to hear them be interested in it, and I can't wait for the next SGAP leaders to ask me questions so I can answer them. What would be the one piece of advice you would give somebody that's uh, thinking about trying to be more active? Um, I would say you can never be too curious and never be scared to share your ideas. I've heard so many wonderful pitches and ideas from peers of mine, even in school, and they're like, oh, I have this idea, but I don't think I'll share it because I don't think it's worth the while. If you have an idea, put it out there, reach out to someone. Someone will like your idea, and you never know how far you'll go. That's really great advice. Zula Oliveira, Brandon Prasad. This has just been amazing today because all this innovation, moving the world forward in a different way. That's what we're all about. So if you want to find out more or see how to get in touch with these kids or this program, you can go to SGAP Leaders. And if you want to find out how to get games for your industry, you can go to One Huddle. 
And remember, everyone, to go to the Passage to Profit page at GearHeartLaw.com, S-G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W, and vote for your favorite project. So now Google Passage to Profit and make your choice. Remember, you can only vote once, and you have until next Sunday at 8 p.m. to vote. This evening's pitch contestants will receive a Passage to Profit t-shirt, and the best overall vote getter for the show will receive a professionally produced video of their pitch, a $500 value. And before we sign off, I want to thank everyone who participated today. This is always so great. And it really shows what our young people are doing to change the world in a very positive way. I also want to thank Sam Cayucci from One Huddle. Before we go, do you have any final words of wisdom that you'd like to share with our listeners? I think today, more than ever, we have a, a tremendous amount of technology at our fingertips. You have people at all corners of society that have to... Get involved. I think the one thing I took away today is that if you know everybody can play a part, uh, there's more at our fingertips to do that. You just have to be willing to try. One of the missing ingredients today in learning and development is struggle. When we did all of our research on the way the brain learns, we constantly came back to this element of struggle where you learn more through a test than you do by reading or watching. I just saw a Microsoft study the other day that came out said that the average attention span of a millennial is nine seconds. A goldfish is 11. <laughs> What's a baby boomer? <laughs> I'm afraid to ask. <laughs> what? what do you say again? <laughs> so, you know, I think that for us, it's if we keep building videos, manuals, and we don't make it accessible, the reality is if you can't remember what you learned, you didn't learn it. 87% of what you learn in a live training, you forget within 30 days. Our platform is constantly measuring where you're struggling and then spinning up. We have an algorithm in our platform that's spinning up questions user by user based off what they are individually struggling with, something you can never do with a traditional e-learning course. Wow, that's brilliant. You know, when I had to study for the patent bar, everybody told me just take the old exams online. And that's basically what I did. And that's what got me through it. Just like immersion, when you learn a new language, what do we always tell people? You know, if you want to learn Spanish, move to Spain. Uh, (laughs) uh, So, you know, it's the same thing. I think that if we just think that uh, training is an event and you check a box, Uh, We're putting our employees in a position where there's no way they're going to be able to react to the way work is changing. Uh, We need tools that react faster. That's really great. And I'd also like to thank Michelle Joseph from SGAP. Michelle, do you have any final words for our listeners? First of all, I want to say thank you for Passage to Profits. And this is a wonderful opportunity for our students to pitch. I'd just like to share with uh, all the folks out there that really invest in our future, invest the seeds uh, of our future truly to our students Uh, They are the ones that will inherit the earth, so to speak, and we need to make sure that they have an education and a background that they need and the tools that they need to be able to uh, take us to the next level. We've been doing this as SCAP leaders, uh, the concept, since 2010. Uh, We became a 501c3 in 2016, and during that process, I've seen students who were in middle school who are now graduated, going to Ivy League schools, who've come back and spoken to other students. So planting those seeds are critical. And the sooner we do it, uh, the better. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. And uh, how can we find you on SGAP again? Yes, sgapleaders.org is our website. We have a donate button there. We are a 501c3. And we are always welcome to partner with organizations as well as accept sponsorships from different organizations as well. And we would love to thank everybody and our media maven, Kenya Gibson, our wonderful producer, Noah Fleischman, our incredible engineer, Rob Barrett, and the whole iHeart team. And don't forget to join us next week for another excellent speaker and another round of pitches. You can start thinking about what your next pitch will be. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This is Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart on iHeart Radio with Passage to Profit, WOR 710, the voice of New York. Mm-hmm.